68, AL Cy Young and MVP, Denny McLean. The uh, trip of play against Baltimore, we had, I always had uh, a lot of trouble with Baltimore, and I had a lot of trouble with Boog Powell. In fact, it got so bad at one time, uh, whether it was Price or Freehand, I used to tell them, let's tell them what's coming and not waste any more time. Let's just get it over with. So uh, it's a Sunday afternoon game. Uh, men on first and second, nobody out. The second or third inning, and uh, we're pretty close to getting our brains blown out, me especially. And uh, I think it was Freehand, right? Was Freehand catching that thing? Yeah. He walks out and he says, how do you want to pitch Powell? I says, after five years, you want to know how to pitch Powell. I haven't got him out in five years. He said, well, let's just pitch him hard inside. Now, don't ask me why. I, I think a lot of pitchers would say the same thing. There's just some hitters that give you a lot of trouble, and you just can't make a good pitch. So uh, Freehand goes behind, sets up the glove for a fastball inside. The ball, of course, is right down the middle, belt high. I mean, right down the middle. And he hits a line drive back at my waist area. You guys missed that one, didn't you? Groin. And groin, yeah, thank you very much. And I caught the ball through to second base to Tommy Magic, sitting on our stage today. And we threw it on to Norm Cash for a triple play. But that's the, the only way, I, I, don't, I think that may be the only time I got him out all year. Because the next time he came up, uh, I, I wanted to hit him. I wanted to knock him down. And I hit him and I broke his hand. So uh, he was through for the year. Son of a bitch, I hated him. <laughs> September 14th, a bright, sunny Saturday afternoon. Denny McLean attempting to become the first 30-game winner in more than 30 years. It turned out to be the game of the century, as the nation forgot its worries long enough to watch Denny challenge the record of the great Dizzy Dean. You don't expect him to keep doing it like this all year. I thought I was, I thought I was in a little bit of trouble, but they pulled me out again. The pitch swung on, a ground ball. Peter, he goes to the play. Field is shallow. The pitch. Fast ball. Makes it. Tigers are going to win this win. Tigers are winning one. And McKay wins his 30th ball game of the year. As Willie Horton comes up with a big base hit in the bottom of the ninth. The Tigers score two. And look at this celebration on the field. It's the greatest bunch of ball players I've ever played with. And I've been saying that for five years. They got to change the game if anybody's going to get a shot to win 30. Number one, they got to raise the mound. If you raise the mound back to six inches where it belongs, you're going to have fewer guys getting hurt. That's number one. Number two, guys are going to have more leverage to throw a much better fastball. And number three, if they bring back the strike zone a little bit, you know, give, give the guys, although last night was an exception, they gave all the high strikes last night. But bring the high strike back, take a little bit of the way of the strike low. And just make it the way it was. I think I think you'd have a lot more guys winning 20 ball games. And I think, and I don't think they would. I'm not sure how many really want to go out there every fourth day, but I think you'd have more guys on a 16 inch mound trying to go further and further in the ball game. I really do. I think it would make all the difference in the world because baseball's done nothing but all the good things for hitters. They've done nothing for pitchers since 1969 when they reduced the mound. And sooner or later, somebody's got to look at it. We're losing too many good pitchers to arm injuries. And if they continue to do that, you know, they're going to wind up with, with the mediocrity, I think, that uh, really is in the game today. Does the Tiger or Bulldog and Justin Verlander feel like times you might have? Oh, I don't know. I, uh, uh, he's uh, certainly got great stuff. Uh, when he's got his control, he's as good as, as, there, as I've ever seen. I mean, you can compare him to the McDowells and the Teons and the Longbergs and all of those guys, no question about it. The way I, the way I like to look at it is he's a, he's a type of pitcher that could have pitched in any era, whether it was the 60s, the 50s, the 70s, he could pitch in any era. It's like Cabrera. He could play in any era. You can't say that about every player playing today that could have played in some of those other eras when, the, eras when there were different 
um, whenever fewer teams, fewer players. So, but those are two guys that can play. He has got uh, some kind of stuff. Back to your team, when you win a championship together at any level in every sport, there's a bond for life. Isn't it? Absolutely. Um, you know, and uh, you know, there's been a lot of rumors about some of the guys in our club not getting along once in a while, and what have you. Listen, that's no different than society. You have na you have an argument with your neighbor once in a while. The difference with our uh, misunderstandings, as you might call them, is you know they appeared in the papers here every day. But uh, the bottom line is there, there's such a, a good feeling when you see guys. Uh, Mickey Stanley's up there. Uh, Lolich is there, Price is there, all these guys are there that were a part of the ball club. I mean, some of the things you're for, I forgot that John Hiller won nine games that year. Uh, you know, and, and not only that, but I think he had 50 appearances, yet he pitched over 100 innings. What does that tell you about a relief pitcher? You know, I mean, they were, they were pitching two and three innings at the time as a relief pitcher. So, you know, game has changed. I love Mayo. What else? His first year he finished second. His second year he wins the World Series. The third year he finishes second and nobody's ever given him credit for what he did. Yeah, Mayo. Last time at bat at Tiger Stadium, uh, you guys kind of let him know it was coming down the heart of the plate. Is that true? Well, it is true. Jimmy Let's. Price was our catcher that day, Let's. and uh, we got, uh, we were leading the ball game, I think it was six to one, it was the seventh or eighth inning and game was well in hand and I went to Price, called Jimmy out to the mound and I said, listen, we want him to hit one. And Jim looked at me and said, what the hell are you talking about, hit one? And I said, listen, the only way you and I are ever gonna get in the Hall of Fame is if we give the ball and the home run for Mantle to go over 535 with the Yankees. So uh, three or four pitches later, uh, I, listen, after two pitches, Mickey took the first two pitches. Now we know we're not working with a road scholar, right? I mean, what the hell is going on? We're trying to, and he's asking Price, he's asking Emmett Ashford, the umpire, what is he doing? What the hell is he doing? Is he gonna do it again? And Jimmy comes out for the third pitch and he says, man, I said, what the hell do you want now? He said, Mantle wants to know if you're gonna do it again and so does Emmett Ashford. I said, for Christ's sake, I said, tell him please. So we throw the next pitch, the ball sailed a little bit, and he fouled the ball down the right field line. And then uh, I yelled at Mickey, I said, where the hell do you want the damn thing? He put his hand out over the plate and hit it uh, 390 feet straight away center field. And it was one of the greatest moments I think we ever experienced as a battery. It really was.